Oh, you have it. I just had it. Yeah. Okay. You want to get more water? Yeah, let me do that real quick. Go ahead. Good afternoon. Let's get started. Welcome back to the spring series of the UT Energy Symposium. For those who are coming here for the first time, we have this series every Thursday, the same location, 5.15 to 6.15. Before I introduce our speaker today, I have a couple of announcements to make. Some of you are probably auditing this for a graduate portfolio program on energy studies. If you're doing that, we have a sign up sheet at the back. There, please be sure to note your name and email there so, so that we can be in contact with you about information about this uh, series and we can keep you engaged in the ongoing uh, discussions. Uh, on that, folks, students who are registered for this course, I also remind you that uh, every week after the talk, within 24 hours, you have to go on Blackboard and take part on the online discussion forum. Uh, the students who will be in the guided portfolio program on energy studies, we'll also be required to participate in that uh, online forum. That's why we need your uh, contact information. Uh, our speaker next week will be Russell Gold, who is a senior energy reporter at the Wall Street Journal. He'll talk to us on a ringside seat, what I have learned for, from 10 years reporting on and living through the fracking revolution. With that, it gives me tremendous pleasure to introduce our speaker today, Calvin Crowder, who is the, who is the president of Electric Transmission Texas, ETT, which is an Austin based company uh, with equal shares owned by AEP and Mid American Energy Holdings Company. ETT constructs, owns, and operates transmission facilities across ERCOT as a regulated as utility. Calvin has vast ranging experiences. Uh, he has been in the industry for over 20 years now, uh, tremendous impact on public policy, product development, uh, in all areas of the utility uh, industry for many, many years. He led the integration into the PGM interconnection, which as uh, many of you might know, was a very, a very big deal. He has been the managing director of public policy also at AAP. Calvin holds a bachelor's and a master's degree in economics from the New Mexico State University. Please join me in welcoming him. Thanks. Thank you, Dr. Ray, and thank you all for suffering through the elements to come here. Um, uh, first of all, let me tell you, I've, I've got just getting over a cold, so I'm, I'm going to be drinking water. We've got a cough drop, but uh, hopefully uh, I won't be too disruptive in that. Um, I, it doesn't feel cold to me because uh, Tuesday I was in Columbus, Ohio. The temperature was 2 degrees and the wind chill was negative 12. And then Wednesday I was in Washington, D.C. as they got blanketed with snow and 20 degrees. So this feels kind of warm, believe it or not. But uh, what I thought I'd do is I'm going to do a quick little commercial about ETT and its owners. Then uh, a, a very fast transmission 101 just to level set. And I've got a number of slides, but I'll move through them quickly. I'm not, never sure how much people know about the industry. And so when I start throwing around terms, it's helpful. Then I wanted to talk to you about a big project that's been going on here in Texas for transmission to integrate wind power, and then hopefully we'll have some uh, room at the end for questions. So I'm open to any questions you might have and uh, might even have an answer for you. So we'll get started now. <clears throat> 
uh, Electric Transmission Texas is the company I'm working for. It's a transmission only utility. So we serve customers by moving power across regions solely within the ERCOT region of Texas. And Texas is uh, a, a vast state. About 85% of it is made up of what's called ERCOT, the Electric Reliability Council of Texas. I'll show you a slide a little bit later that shows you where ERCOT is. But there's a little bit on the far east side and the panhandle of Texas that is in the southwest power pool. And then in the very western corner, El Paso is in the Western Energy uh, Coordinating Council. And then actually now um, Beaumont in that area is in the Midwest um, Independent System Operator. So I'm not sure why Beaumont and New Orleans are in the Midwest, but politics sometimes overwhelm engineering. Uh, ETT was formed in 2007 for the purpose of building transmission within Texas. We started with a $70 million in assets and, and uh, over the course of the past seven years have built $2 billion in assets uh, here to support the needs of the state. And about a billion and a half of that was the CREZ. We've got a $3 billion plan, so CREZ will end up being half of that. I'll talk a little bit more about CREZ. Uh, ETT is owned by two companies, AEP or American Electric Power is the largest electric utility in the country and has the largest transmission system in the country. Uh, we also own about 99% of the 765,000 uh, kV uh, transmission in the, uh, in the system, so um, in, the, in the country. So you can see the eastern AEP footprint is what we call the old AEP, and then down in this region is, was a company, Central and Southwest, that was merged into AEP in 2000. I worked for Central and Southwest and then moved to Columbus with the merger and lived there until I came down in 2007 to run this operation. So AEP back in around 2005, 2006 saw a need for a lot of transmission here in Texas. We were also building a lot of transmission in the PJM. As, as Dr. I mentioned, we integrated into PJM in 2004 and we had to build a lot of transmission to move that uh, low cost coal power from the Ohio Valley over to the Mid-Atlantic region where they were suffering from a, a great deal of, uh, of uh, low um, generation availability. And so we were also building generators. We built uh, plants in Arkansas and in Kentucky and, and in Ohio. And so all these capital demands on the company uh, required the CEO to make decisions about what to invest in. And being a good CEO, he wanted to invest in all of it. So he challenged his team to find creative ways to invest in everything. And what we came up with in Texas was we knew we had about $3 billion to spend in the course of a, less than a decade. And we didn't have $3 billion once you add up all those numbers. So we looked for a partner to create a joint venture to build this transmission here in Texas. And the partner we ended up with is Mid-American Energy. Um, Mid-American Energy is based out of Des Moines, Iowa, but they have holdings of both electric and gas across, uh, across mostly the western side of the United States. They have some holdings in uh, the Philippines and in England. And mo most importantly, they are the energy platform for Berkshire Hathaway. So Warren Buffett and Berkshire Hathaway do all their energy investments through Mid-American. And about the time we were looking for a partner to invest in this transmission venture, uh, Mr. Buffett mentioned that he wanted Mid-American to invest $10 billion in electric infrastructure per year for 10 years. And so they had quite a challenge and they were looking for opportunities. We were looking for a partner and, and a marriage was born. So we went to the commission, we obtained approval for the joint venture, uh, we received utility status, and with the two owners and the management team that I have, we began uh, constructing transmission. So that's where I come from and, and what we've been up to now. I'm gonna get into a little bit just of the fundamentals of electricity and then some of the issues that we're seeing across our region. So um, I don't think you get extra credit, but it is a transmission 101. And the basic definitions and components, and a lot of you electrical engineers will roll your eyes, but this is sometimes helpful to just back up. So when we talk about a volt, we're talking about the pressure on the system. Current is the movement of electrons through the system. So we talk about power or KW or MW. I talk about megawatts a lot because that's the typical size that we deal with in the EHV or extra high voltage world that we live in in transmission. 
And then energy is the amount of work that be, can be done in the course of an hour, for example, so a megawatt hour. So if you think about power, or megawatt is the size of the door, there's a double door there, there's a double door there, you can move two people through that door, that's the power, and then the energy is how many people will flow through those doors in the course of an hour. So that's basically the difference between a megawatt or a megawatt hour. Uh, we also have a couple of concepts of alternating current and direct current. Alternating current being the electrical pressure measured in volts, and direct current being the movement of charge through a conductor. Direct current and alternating current were a big topic of discussion back about 100 years ago. In fact, uh, these two gentlemen, you may recognize the names Edison and Westinghouse, battled over whether AC or DC should be the basis for our American electric grid as that grid was being built. And uh, Westinghouse won out, um, but Edison still took advantage of that. He was no nothing if not an opportunist and made a lot of money on it. Interestingly, and I'll talk a little bit later, that DC, AC question is starting to come back around, and there's some real good applications for DC we're seeing now with, with new technologies and power transformers. But uh, the guy over there who doesn't get a lot of credit, although he's got a cool car named after him now, Nikolai, Nikolai Tesla, um, was, was an amazing guy and, and uh, actually was the brain behind both of the two uh, gentlemen's success. So um, interesting to go back and look at history and, and read a little bit more about them and especially how Tesla ended up uh, um, penniless um, and destitute. Okay, so a megawatt, how much is a megawatt? That's what we deal in. A uh, megawatt is one million watts. It will power 10,000 of these light bulbs that are exactly the same light bulb that we were using 100 years ago when those guys were fighting about it. It'll power about 800 average homes in North America. In the summertime in Texas, it'll power about 250 because we have a pretty large air conditioning load. And so the, the components of the grid are also the components of our market in the electric industry. You basically have generators that create power, transmission lines that move that power long distances, and then where the customers are, you have a distribution system and a meter to that customer. And so the generation is at a very low voltage, and it's delivered to customers. You can see 120 volts down there delivered to customers at a low voltage. But the electric grid itself is at an extremely high voltage because the higher the voltage, the lower the losses as far as how much power you can move across long distances. As, as the components of the grid are, so is the market. So when we look at generation, uh, we've typically had fossil fuel generators, coal and gas, some hydroelectric, nuclear came about uh, in the 70s and 80s, and now we're seeing a lot of wind and just behind it solar. So these are the different technologies that drive the generation or creation of power in pretty much the world uh, as we see it. Then on the load side, everybody recognizes their meter. We're putting in smart meters now that look a little bit different than that, but the basic technology that we're replacing it with, again, goes back 100 years. Uh, delivers to the home, delivers to the businesses, and uh, loads can be smaller than your cell phone or as large as an industrial facility, which could be tens of millions of watts. Lately, we've seen a lot of data centers for people like Amazon and Google, and these data centers are just hogs of energy, plus the, the quality of power has to be very pure for them. So there's a lot of technology that has to go in providing them services. They don't like hiccups and momentary outages. It, it really wreaks havoc with data. The distribution lines are the lines you see running down your street, and those are the ones that basically deliver to your house. Uh, and they're usually a, a radial line. They're not a network, but they deliver from point A to point B, from source to load. So that's common terminology we use, source to load. And they're certainly not used for interstate commerce. You can't move a lot of power on a distribution line. Number of distribution lines are underground. My, sub, my uh, subdivision I live in, it's all underground, so you don't see any wires anywhere. It's buried. You don't see a lot of underground transmission just because the voltage is so high. Um, it, it's, it can be uh, dangerous, uh, much more dangerous, and difficult to harness that energy so far down. That's why transmission uh, towers are so tall, to keep that electric and magnetic field far away from people. So the transmission, that what I know and love, uh, that's the part we're going to talk about. And it is uh, um, an interesting development of the transmission grid that occurred uh, over the years. Uh, before we had a transmission grid, you needed to build a generator right where the load was. And so the first generator 
uh, in the United States was the Pearl Street Station at, and the address 255, 257 Pearl Street, Manhattan. Uh, it served that little area on the tip of Manhattan, about 500 customers. There were distribution lines to serve those customers. But folks like Westinghouse and uh, Edison figured out pretty quickly, hey, I can make a lot more money if I can put in more uh, uh, customers. So they started networking uh, the generators and the loads. And so if you have three generators and you regionally connect those with distribution, you can serve more customers, you can make more money. But also if you lose a generator, you don't black out the entire load, you have other opportunities. So this became uh, a way that transmission served to move generation to load. It also allowed you to get the generators outside of the downtown of Manhattan. You could have them in Staten Island or no offense to people in Staten Island, but you know somewhere that you don't necessarily have a lot of people wanting to live. And then you could build the transmission to move that power. And uh, there was a, an environmental uh, factor. There was also a fuel factor. You could move it. And that's why if you look at the American Electric Power AEP system, we have huge coal plants along the Ohio River. That's because Appalachia is one of the biggest, the two biggest coal producing regions in the country. And they can get the coal out of the mines, float it down the river right to the power plant, use the transmission lines to move that electricity to the cities in the mid-Atlantic, Chicago, Cleveland, etc. <clears throat> so then we started realizing that we could use transmission to connect networks. And so you could have a city here and a city there and you could use regional transmission. And that became an improvement in reliability, lower costs, and then it really was the beginning of these market concepts where if you had a generator that was near a load but it was expensive and a generator that was far away, if you could connect that with transmission, you could get the lower cost generator. And so you could develop a market and any time of the day or night, you could price power based on the least cost generator deliverable to that load. Three interconnections exist in this country, and an interconnection is basically an integrated grid of transmission that supports load and generation. There's the eastern interconnection, the western interconnection, and Texas. So um, we are an island electrically. We're proud of that. Um, there was reason for that. It goes back to the, you know, the World War I and then World War II as well. We produced a lot of munitions in Texas. There was a great deal of concern that our enemies would attack us on the coast and attack our grid and harm our ability to make tanks and, and bullets. And so the grids were maintained separately and there was a conscious decision not to connect them. In fact, until recently, Florida was, and recently maybe 30 years ago, Florida was its own grid. But now you basically have three interconnections and so any ties between these are very small ties or asynchronous DC ties. And we'll talk about those in a minute. So DC technology, as you know, um, Westinghouse won out and uh, Edison didn't. But with new technologies, we're seeing a lot of opportunities for DC. Uh, high voltage AC reduces losses, but DC has even less losses. You can move power three, four, five hundred miles with no losses. And so we're seeing a lot of proposals to move power from the windy regions in the Midwest out to the East Coast or down to California in order to tap into that wind and move it from point A to point B. The problem with DC is you can't, you can't connect along the way cheaply. Um, a typical substation on an AC level costs maybe 20 to 30 million dollars. If you want to put a DC substation halfway along a line to tap in a load, it can be upwards of a billion or a billion and a half dollars. So it's extremely expensive but that point to point with those two converters on either end can really move a lot of power with no losses. The other thing DC is good for is submarine transmission. So putting electricity underwater makes people nervous. DC doesn't have the electrifying effect of AC and you can use DC power through cables. Germany's doing a lot of this. They have a lot of offshore wind and they have a converter station on basically a, an oil platform that converts that power, consolidates those wind turbines, con converts that power to DC, puts it in an underground cable, then another converter station on the ground that puts it onto their AC electric grid. So that's a technology that's really coming about in Europe and uh, it's talked about in the US. Um, the Kennedys slowed it down in Massachusetts, but uh, we could see things. And in fact, in Texas, folks have studied putting wind farms along the, the uh, shallow shelf of the Gulf Coast 
uh, we've, we've not seen any real uh, movement on that, but there's been a lot of studies going on. And then lastly, back to back, and this is where you have two asynchronous systems and you want to connect them without making them synchronous. They can operate at different frequencies and DC back to back technology does a great job at doing that. And AEP, in fact, owns all of the DC ties or operates all the DC ties that connect Texas to, you know, the, we, we like to call the rest of the United States the non-Texas region. So that's the non-Texas region. Here's uh, the DC you see. So the green lines show you these DC lines. And these are all moving bulk power again from a region. Like up here where you see there's um, near Square Butte, they're moving power from windy regions to where there's a lot of load. Down into California from Nevada and then from the hydro that's up in the northwest in Washington and Oregon. And then the Quebec, New England line. There's also some uh, orange um, right here with a cross sound cable, Neptune, and then Trans Bay cable. Those are underwater cables. This one goes under San Francisco Bay and it moves power from the Oakland region over to San Francisco. So these are all fairly new technologies that are being deployed. And then if you see around ERCOT and then right up the middle where the east and west interconnect are divided, those are DC ties connecting those asynchronous systems. In ERCOT, we have connections in New Mexico, Oklahoma, and then on the Arkansas-Louisiana border to the southwest power pool, which is in the eastern interconnect. And we also have connections to Mexico in Laredo and down in Brownsville. So those allow us to move power and control the movement of power across those DC ties. The DC ties in Texas are primarily to preserve Texas's separation from the rest of the United States because when you go to get approval for anything you do in the transmission world, anywhere but Texas, you go to Washington, D.C. In Texas, we come here to Austin. Austin regulates all transmission within ERCOT. And some judge about, let's see, 1980, what was that, 30 years ago, ruled that as long as the electrons in the Texas grid were not intermingled or co-mingled with electrons in the outside grid, then Texas would not be in interstate commerce, which is a legal you know, finding that you then are subject to federal regulation. And so um, the engineers laugh about that, but the lawyers got real okay with it, and they said that's fine. If we don't commingle electrons, then Texas will continue to be non-FERC jurisdictional. And so to this day, any power that we move in any major way between Texas and the SPP um, is moved through DC where you you schedule the power one way or the other, it doesn't alternate in current. So that's what happens when you get the lawyers involved in engineering. <clears throat> so controlling the grid, the biggest challenge in controlling this grid, and this shows you the everything from DC to 765 down to uh, 230 kV, is you can't store electricity. Battery technology is not there in, the, in a big way. Um, we have a battery. Uh, ETT does. We put it in Presidio, Texas, and I've got a picture of it here. This battery, that door, you can drive a semi through. We actually brought semi trucks in to deliver these batteries. There's 20 of these racks. They're stacked five uh, deep and four high, and that entire warehouse full of batteries is enough to serve the town of Presidio in 2009. Presidio has now grown because the border checkpoint expanded and this battery can serve about two-thirds of the town. So you can imagine the battery technology that it would take to serve a city like Austin or even Dallas. Batteries are not there yet, so this grid has to be managed such that demand and supply are equal at all times. We have dispatchers that work round the clock, 24 hours, and their job is if the frequency goes from 60 hertz to 59.9 or 60.1, they adjust bringing a generator up or down to keep it at 60 hertz. They have four seconds to make those adjustments. And so those dispatchers are in control rooms with computers and they're constantly moving our, um, our system up and down to maintain demand and supply. That's what's done in the Eastern Interconnect, the Western Interconnect, and in ERCOT. When you don't manage the frequency, <laughs> you have a blackout. And uh, uh, I remember well the 2003 blackout. I was actually in Virginia with the president of our uh, uh, Appalachian Power Company. Um, and we started getting these calls. And uh, the, the blackout that occurred um, was because there was a drop in frequency. A tree 
contacted a line near Cleveland in the First Energy System. First Energy had transferred the ownership of their control to the Midwest ISO. First Energy didn't have the computer monitors to see that that line was out. MISO didn't have their computers uh, configured correctly and they didn't see that that was out. That line caused another line to trip. These were 500 kV lines. That line caused a generator to, to trip. And when a generator trips, this, um, um, this coal plant is, has a turbine that's um, about as long as this room and about eight feet wide that's spinning very fast. That turbine ripped across the room and busted through the wall and they found it in a field about a quarter of a mile away. So that generator burned up. Four other generators went. Detroit went black. It went up around Canada, lost the southern part of Canada. New York City went black. People had to walk out of New York City. It was a tremendous uh, effect. You can see here Long Island before the blackout and Long Island after the blackout. You can see Cleveland, Detroit, Toronto, all black after the blackout. Here's the people walking out of uh, New York City. It took weeks to get power back up everywhere it needed to go, and it took months to get the generators that were damaged back to where they went. Um, we were fortunate in Columbus, Ohio, uh, the AEP dispatcher that was there was getting calls from MISO saying you need to move all the power you can north because we're going to lose our system. Our guy had been doing this for 30 years. He said, you lost your system. I'm opening all the ties. He opened the ties, protected that or else we would have lost the entire Mid-Atlantic. In hearings that were held by the Senate and, and uh, House of Representatives a year and a half later, they found that the AEP dispatcher violated the protocols, but he did it in the way that he should have done it, and he kept probably the Eastern Interconnect from collapsing. So one guy knowing what he was doing and willing to take the chance, but you can see you know, the devastation that can happen if, uh, if we don't maintain that frequency at 60 hertz. That's another shot. I just like, you know, that's uh, the lower tip of Manhattan. Um, and it's, uh, there's, there's a few places you see where they have some generation uh, on site, but for the most of it, it's, uh, it's dark. Um, real quickly, the transmission ownership and structure. Um, about two-thirds of U.S. transmission is owned uh, by investor-owned utilities. The rest are uh, municipals and cooperatives, electric cooperatives, created to serve uh, the regions that uh, are less populated. And most transmission owners have turned operational control over to independent regional operators. This is a big push by the federal government under George W. Bush and a FERC uh, chairman named Pat Wood, um, who's actually from Port Arthur, Texas, and uh, served as a Texas chairman and then a federal chairman. And they, and they required all the transmission owners to turn over control. The reason being, all of the large utilities like AEP and Mid-American, Exelon, Intergy, Centerpoint, Encore, owned generation and transmission. In order to make a pure market of generation, you want to separate that from the transmission. And so the transmission control was turned over to these independent operators. And the independent operators then created markets for trading uh, generation and generation um, services. Transmissions regulated by both federal, regional, uh, federal and state uh, commissions, as well as a lot of regional and local rules that apply to it. And there's a number of federal entities, the DOE, the FERC, uh, the Department of Agriculture, Forest Service, uh, Bureau of Land Management, federal utilities, on and on, that regulate. Again, Texas, we're a little bit different. A lot of these entities have an intervener status here in Texas, so they can come and make their case, but the Texas Commission ultimately decides. The rules change if we cross federal lands, then we are subject to federal rules, but fortunately there's not a lot of that in Texas. And that is the key, and I speak at a lot of conferences and I talk to a lot of people around the country. Texas is building more transmission than any other state in this country, and the primary reason is because the decision-making is here in Austin and it's not getting bottled up at a federal level where you have a lot of distance between the policymakers and the needs of the people. I'm not going to spend a lot of time on this. Um, We'll talk about power flow across the grid. Okay, so when you look at the EHV, or extra high voltage system, 345,000 volts and above, this is what you see. And it's pretty obvious that there's a lot on the East Coast, and there's a lot on the West Coast, and there's not much in between. And that's how this system was developed, again, as a network to connect generators and load. A lot of people in those, on those coastal regions, in fact, 
I read that 75% of the U.S. population lives within 100 miles of a coast. A lot of people in those regions, not many people in the middle. So therefore, you're building the generators close to the people, the transmission to connect it, not a lot of transmission in the middle of the country. And that was fine. That served our purposes as we were vertically integrated, regulated utilities with central planning, building power plants and transmission lines to deliver power to customers. It was the economic engine that brought the success that we have in this country. Electricity is the basis for everything we know and we do in our society. However, um, coal is not popular. Uh, in fact, natural gas isn't popular to some people. Nuclear isn't popular. So there's a desire to see more renewable power, more solar power in this country, more wind power in this country. The economics don't, don't uh, work for it or else you would have seen that grow up. The economics work for coal. The economics work for nuclear. The economics work for gas. More so now that you'll hear in the next presentation next week with the fracking, gas is very cheap. Those technologies, you can produce power cheaply. So how do you bring about more use of renewables if the economics don't work out? That's where policymakers come in. If it's an important policy, policymakers can make decisions to increase the amount of that non-economic source. Wind was a great example of it, and there's a production tax credit at the federal level that offsets the cost of wind and allows the wind to be competitive from a business perspective. So if you're a businessman and it takes you eight cents a kilowatt hour to put your wind on the grid and the price that you get is five cents, you're not going to make a lot of money. You can do as much volume as you want, but you're not going to make up the difference between eight cent cost and five cent price. But if the production tax credit from the federal government gives you three and a half cents, then there you go. You're in the money and you can build wind, you can go to the bank, you can get a loan, you can make money, you can pay salaries and you can grow that business. That's exactly what happened in this country about a decade ago, is we started seeing encouragement of renewables and especially wind because it was the closest. Wind was the closest to economic. And so there was a lot of focus on wind and a lot of policies across the country to encourage more wind use. Uh, things like renewable portfolio standards. If you're a, if you're a utility, you have to have 10% from wind, 10% of, of the power you have. Or if you're a municipality like Austin, you have to buy 20% of your power from wind. And so those renewable portfolio standards plus the production tax credit created this opportunity for wind. The challenge was on the far right here is the average wind speeds across the U.S. Um, the lighter colors in the, in the scale being less, the darker colors being more. So you can see where the best wind is in this country is right in the middle. Um, guess what? There's no transmission. And so you either build wind in the areas where the wind isn't that good or you find a way to get that wind to the load centers. And so it goes back to what I talked about with AEP and the coal generation along the Ohio River Valley. There's the coal, build the generators there, move the electricity, move the energy by wire. That's what's been going on in this country over the past decade. A lot of wind. Um, Texas is number one. Iowa is number two. California is now number three. California did it with renewable portfolio standards. But once they started to put in incentives to build wind where the best wind is, you're starting to see along that corridor a lot of wind being developed. The nice thing about some of the upper central area is there's a lot of coal there as well. The Powder River Basin is the other one of the two largest uh, areas for coal. And so you've got both coal and wind. They're great resources. And you build transmission to move that to the west coast and over to the Chicago area and then onto the grid that already exists to move it to the east. So that's where we're seeing a lot of transmission being built today is to move wind power to those regions that need the power and that have those renewable portfolio standards. Solar is on the left here. Solar is a little bit behind wind. It's probably a good seven or eight years behind, but we're starting to see more solar movement. And you see where the solar is. It's in the great southwest. A little bit here in Texas, but a lot right there in California and in Arizona. Uh, the largest uh, solar plant in the country just went into service, I think, in December. Topaz, it's called, in uh, Southern California, owned by MidAmerican Energy.
mid American Energy is really spending a lot of money on solar plant and on transmission as well. AEP's got a transmission company. So all the utilities are starting to see the value of these things and move into it. Solar in Texas, we see some out in uh, far west Texas. If you fly out like I did when I was going to Columbus this week, you take off from the airport, just north of the airport, there's a big solar park right there in Austin. It's maybe 50 megawatts. It's not giant, but it's there. Uh, I drove down to the valley. There's a 200 megawatt solar park they're putting in the valley. Uh, I was in Chicago. They're taking um, um, parking lots and covering them so people have covered parking. They can charge them a little bit more. And by the way, that cover is a solar collection unit. So now they're collecting solar energy and selling it onto the grid through distributed generation. That's the latest fad is distributed generation, solar and wind at a small level that you sell back onto the grid. So solar is the wave that's coming. Wind is the wave that's here. And the good thing is they both need transmission. So I've got a job. So things are looking good for me. <clears throat> Um, in Texas, we had the CREZ. We, we had these uh, incentives to build transmission. We have low hurdles to creating businesses, some of the lowest hurdles in the country. That's why 20% of the jobs in this country have come from Texas, because it's an easy place to start a business. There's a good labor force. People are, people are moving here. The economy is growing. Everybody's moving new, 60 new cars a day in Austin, they tell me. I can't believe that, but they're all in front of me on Mopac. And... Uh, in 2001, the wholesale market allowed wind to really make a lot of money because of this. And so um, by 2003, we had 5,000 megawatts of wind. And, and ERCOT itself, the total load in ERCOT is 60,000 megawatts. So that was almost 10% wind. We had a huge congestion. And so what we had to do was build transmission to move that wind from the West Texas region uh, to the cities. And so we just finished this year what's called the CREZ system, and that is the system of transmission that moves from these clouded areas. There were five clouded areas. They were called the CREZ zones that the commission said, here's the best wind in Texas. And then all of these lines have been built to move those to the load centers in Dallas, Fort Worth, San Antonio, Austin. And then as you saw, we've got a, a grid that goes on down to Houston and, and South Texas. So this has been the latest movement. It started in 2003. We finished it in 2013. That's a decade for utilities. We move at glacial speed. That's like the speed of light to, in 10 years, build um, over 2,200 uh, miles of transmission. And now we've got uh, wind at 10,000 megawatts and plans for, I believe, 18,500. And if you add up all of the wind generation requests at ERCOT today, it's approaching 24,000 megawatts of wind. So you build it, and they will come. The transmission has been built. The wind farms are going up in the panhandle. They're already there in West Texas. And uh, Texas, if it were its own country, which we like to think we are, um, would be the fifth largest wind producing country in the world. But we are the largest wind producing state in the union. So that's a quick look at what's going on. Here's one of our CREZ lines. And those guys actually are hanging off a buggies doing that, uh, 15 stories tall up there at the top. And uh, this is a series of our compensator, which is a new technology needed to manage the intermittency of the wind. And uh, this is a, um, a series compensation system that's used to manage the fact that there are long distances between the wind and the load, and it allows us to support that voltage and make sure the frequency is up. And then this thing, when it was done, we sent a reporter out, and he got a great picture. I just love this picture. It's just um, I don't know, it's almost science fiction. But that platform is energized at 345,000 volts. That's why there's a separate fence around it. And uh, it's, we've got um, 16 of those platforms in West Texas. Okay, things to think about. The system's a massive, highly integrated machine. It's a basic component of our economy. We can't live without it. It's regional operation. There's many, many regulators, um, and it's essential to delivering uh, remote clean energy resources. And I would say if you're interested uh, in a job in the electric industry, I've had 23 years. It's been great. There are plenty of jobs in the industry. Um, you're not going to get rich quick, uh, but it's going to be there. Uh, our company's been around for 107 years. We've paid a dividend that increased for 100 years in a row. And so... Uh, consider the industry. It's a good job. And uh, with that, I'll open it to questions. I know I, I uh, almost used up all the time. So, yeah.
Yes, ma'am. Oh, oh you want to go? Yeah. yeah. So this may not actually project your voice. We're recording it, and we're going to put it online as well as on the slides as well. So. You have to sign a waiver. Sure, Claire, that's a good question. And uh, are you a reporter? No, I'm just joking. Um, yeah, so, so AEP is the largest coal producer in, in the country. In fact, we're the largest uh, purchaser of coal in the Western Hemisphere of the world. And, and so AEP was built on low-cost coal power. It's served well. It's kept rates low, lowest rates in the country. But clearly, the environmental regulation at a federal level is headed towards shutting down coal. And that is a policy decision, and it's one that uh, we have to – uh, address. And so um, we are moving to shut down, I think AP, and, and I'm not sure I get the numbers right, but I think we have around 45,000 megawatts of coal. I think we're shutting down 8,000 megawatts of that now, so almost 20% of our coal fleet is being shut down now. There's probably a number, again, that much that we're going to have to consider as to whether it's economic to invest in all of the retrofits and environmental upgrades that you need to uh, to um, uh, to keep it running and to meet these new uh, federal regulations. And federal regulations are continuing to up the ante as well. And so what we're looking at is uh, a world where coal is, is uh, not the future and the existing coal is under uh, um, a lot of pressure to be shut down. So we are looking at gas. We've bought some gas plants. Um, there's some companies building nuclear. We've, we've got a nuclear plant that we own. We're not planning any more nuclear. There's some issues with that as well. Um, but um, I think gas is cheap now. Um, our CEO said the fastest way to expensive gas is for everybody to build gas plants, but uh, you know everybody's building gas plants. Um, I think in the near term there are going to be some issues. We raised these issues uh, early on in the process, but I think you know there's more of a visionary focus and not a near term focus. In the near term, shutting down the coal plants is going to raise customers' rates, especially in those areas where we're eliminating the jobs for coal and the jobs based on coal and the one of the poorest regions in the country in the Midwest. And so there's going to be a lot of economic challenge there, I think, in the short run. Um, as we build more generation to displace that coal, there's going to be costs associated with that as well. So I think there's going to be a real difficult time for customers. Um, but, uh, you know, if, if the vision is where you want to head, then you have to recognize the short run is going to be painful to get there. So we're doing everything we can to mitigate that. Uh, we're working with our state commissions as well, and, and the EPA has actually been helpful in giving us more time to adapt and to adjust so that we don't have the, the more serious issue of reliability. The time frame they had was going to have us shut down coal plants before anything else could be in place, and that would have caused a lot of power outages, which is definitely not the way you want to go. But I think the EPA has eased up on that, and so we now have time. Uh, but it's definitely going to be an economic hit for the country in the near term. I'll let you Up pick. You. All right. Who would you like? There you go. Yeah. I think you have to push that button and it'll turn green. It should be blinking green now. Yeah. Oh, it is. Okay. All right. Thank you. Um, as you mentioned, there are a lot of regulators uh, to transmission companies. Uh, from your perspective, what, what is a good regulation or a good public policy, uh, especially uh, how do you evaluate policy certainty and why, that's, why that is important to you? Thank you. Right. Good question. Um, yeah, policy certainty is a big thing. So in business, uncertainty means cost. Uh, if we go to a bank and they are uncertain about our business or especially our regulation, they're going to charge us a lot more if we can get money borrowed from them, and that gets passed on to customers. So in our business, certainty is important. Um, we spend a lot of time meeting with regulators. I meet with our state commissioners. We have three here in Texas, and I meet with them regularly just to tell them what's going on in our business, some of the things that we're hearing. And they understand um, that they, their responsibility is the public interest. And a good regulator knows that the public interest – 
includes the utilities health. So I've seen some regulators, and I won't say who, but they weren't in Texas, who felt that the public interest meant the customers should always win and the company should always lose. That's not sustainable over time because a, a, a company who can't recover its costs will ultimately go into bankruptcy. And so those regulators, frankly, were short-lived because it, it wasn't a sustainable situation. A good regulator recognizes they have a balance that they have to strike, a balance between customers, between the utility and its need to earn a reasonable return, and also between environmentalists and economic growth. And those are two very difficult things to manage as well. So. Hi. Um, thank you for that. That was really interesting. Um, so I guess you touched on the fact that economics is a really <coughs> big impact on, I guess, eventually incorporating renewable technology. And I think two of the biggest problems for that is going to be, like, d technologically is intermittency of the renewable tech and obviously storage. So I guess my question deals with, of the two, um, you touched that comp the compensators, I believe, deal with the intermittency problem. Do you see, I guess, battery storage um, increasing faster, or I guess the incorporation of compensators like taking over? Yeah, that's a good question. Um, I see, um, I think battery storage just comes down to the cost, and there's really not been a breakthrough on cost. You've got all these different technologies, lithium ion, sodium sulfur, lead acid, and they all have different pluses and minuses, but basically the cost of putting in large batteries to manage the amount of power we're dealing with is just is just a challenge. I think the compensation systems are really coming a long ways. Compensation systems are as much about power electronics and um, the smart grid as they are about you know the, the 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 wherewithal of the system itself. And so we've seen we deployed in the CRES, we deployed reactors and SVCs and statcoms that were the first of their of existence. And so that it's a cutting edge. There's also a new technology called synchrophasers. Uh, which is really interesting. We put some in ERCOT and PJM and elsewhere, and we're doing some studies with DOE on synchrophasers, which are, are an ability to, to see the system react in milliseconds and adjust to that. And in fact, some of the more visionary people think that you could actually see an outage before it occurs because the components of the system will start giving you that, that uh, recognition of different sine waves. So, so that technology, I think, is, is what we're really going to see in the power electronics and in the ability to manage the, these flows. The storage is going to continue to be a problem, in my view. So back in the back there. Uh, thank you, Mr. Crowder, for the interesting presentation. I, I had a question, I guess, continuing on the theme of regulatory certainty of the Public Utility Commission of Texas is, of course, evaluating how to price its electricity. And most of the debate is focused on generators and consumers. But from a tr I'm just interested to hear from a transmission perspective uh, on that debate. What, what uh, I guess, in your opinion or from your experience, uh, sure. how, do you, how does ETT weigh in on that? Right. And, and uh, you know, the, the good thing is um, I use this term a lot. We're agnostic uh, as to what generation gets put on the grid. We'll move coal electrons will move nuclear electrons. But I think resource adequacy is the, is the concern you're talking about. And that is a big concern here in the state. Um, in fact, I was on the board of ERCOT when we brought that up back in 2010. And we recognized that in 2015 we were going to have a problem with uh, the level of generation that we had versus the level of reserves that we needed. And that the market that we put in place in 2001 may not be enough in the long run to incent the generators to build. You have to have a price that equals a long run marginal cost of your generation. So that's you know the basic economics of it. And if your energy prices <clears throat> are relied on solely to provide the revenues for the generator, then there have to be a few hours every year where the price of electricity goes to thirty thousand dollars a megawatt hour. So what happens though in those situations is there's a political fall back because sometimes retailers don't plan for that and they end up losing money and going bankrupt and there's a lot of turmoil. And so um, in an unfettered market, an energy only market makes sense, but regulators are fetterers and they tend to put price caps. And once you put price caps on the energy, you're not allowing energy prices to reach what they have to in order to provide that full um, amount of money for generators to be incented to build the next megawatt, that long-run marginal cost. And so 
we're looking at other mechanisms to do that in ERCOT um, because the fact of the matter is you, you're going to have price caps. You just are. Legislators don't like customers calling that their, their bill in July was $8,000. You know, that's not going to go well. And so there's going to have to be another way to do it. But the thing that I like to mention to people is we were talking about in 2010 the problem that we had in we, we see in 2015. And we've been dealing with it for a couple of years now. We're getting close to a solution. I think the commissioners will have a solution this year on that. Um, last year, PJM and MISO and New England all said, we think we might have a 2015 problem. Well, if you're starting to talk about it in 2013 and it takes three years to build a generator, then you've got a big problem. And I think that we're going to see that Texas, although we may have wrung our hands and people pointed to us and said that things were wrong, we started talking about it early enough that we're, we're going to have a plan in place uh, to deal with it. But from a transmission perspective, totally agnostic. So, bless you. Uh, yes, sir. And then I'll come over to you. I don't want to ignore the side of the room. Thank you very much for your presentation. That was very good. My question has to do with Texas, but specifically about demand response and where we're moving forward. I would like your thoughts on where you see demand response moving forward in terms of an ancillary service and whether or not, well, it definitely would be um, one of the forms of capacity that we would have under a potential capacity market that the Public Utilities Commission is considering right now. I want to know what you see as the future of demand response, both in our current energy-only market and in a future capacity market. And if you think ERCOT and the PUC would get involved in regulating in some way the existing uh, demand response contracts between uh, retail electric providers and customers, or if they should continue to stay out of that as they largely have nowadays. Mm -hmm. Okay, good question. Demand response being um, uh, you send a signal to the customer and they reduce their usage in times of peak. So if you think about, you know, the use of power um, for, for probably 8,760 hours of the year, which is the whole year, uh, you need a base level of electricity at all times. And then there's maybe a shoulder period where you need a little bit more, and then there's that peak where you need the maximum. And so the challenge with uh, generation is it's based on a megawatt basis, again, the size of the door, uh, is a megawatt, the size of the door has to be big enough to meet that peak, even if 8,720 hours of the year you're not at that peak, you're somewhere below it. If you don't meet that peak, what you have is a blackout, which is, I guess, the ultimate demand response, right? And so that's not where we want to be in this country or in this state. And so we have to have enough generation or resources to meet that peak, even though those aren't used throughout the year. And so what are the options? The options are generation or reducing your usage. And reducing usage in a controlled manner is demand response. We've done that uh, in the past for years. In fact, in Corpus Christi in Houston, there's a great deal of interruptible load that are, generate, or that are large industrial customers that have been willing to take the opportunity to trip off at high peak periods in return for a lower kilowatt hour price for the rest of the year. So they pay less money, but then when that peak gets hit, they get tripped off. The thing that, um, that my experience in working at Central Power and Light Company early in my career with those large industrials was they all loved that low price, but any time we tripped them off, the governor was calling. And so I think demand response has a, an interesting component to it in that you have to be sure that it's actually going to be there and that it's mandatory and you don't say, hey guys, would you mind turning your air conditioner off when it's 110 degrees and they don't do it. You have to have the control to turn that air conditioner off and then also is it sustainable over time. I think in Texas we're a long ways from that. There's a lot of demand response opportunity in Texas. It hasn't really developed. And I think the commission is going to take some steps to do that and encourage that through the retail providers. If you look at an area like PJM, they relied too much on demand response. And last year, they actually got in trouble because it wasn't there when they called on it. And now they're having to revisit all those programs and how much they're really paying for those things. So there's a sweet spot somewhere in between. And we're probably behind it. And they probably got a little bit ahead of it in that region. So. You mentioned that there were some problems with nuclear power and trying to connect with that. Uh, can you elaborate a little bit more on what those problems are? Yeah, the, the nuclear uh, power is, is really the fear factor and uh, the challenges of siding and 
the um, cost of uh, ensuring the controls that, that you won't have a Three Mile Island or a Fukushima or a Chernobyl. And the, the one company that's really pushing hard to build nuclear, and it's the Vogel units over um, uh, that Southern Company's building in the Southeast, uh, they're just seeing the cost go out of control because the NRC has such redundancy to the controls that it's very, very expensive. You know, we look at, at gas plants, you know, two, three, four hundred dollars a megawatt. That coal plant's probably close to four thousand dollars a megawatt by the time, or I'm sorry, that nuclear plant. Coal's probably a thousand dollars a megawatt. You want to run those all the time. But I think nuclear, especially with the most recent one, with Fukushima, it's just such a concern for people. Um, in fact, there's a new nuclear technology called modular nuclear. It's a much smaller nuclear unit. It's in the hundreds, not thousands of megawatts. It's very safe. It's self-contained. It can be deployed, you know, in near a city without a problem or in a neighborhood. Um, and in fact, there were a couple states that were about to pass laws to allow it to go forward. And then when Fukushima happened, it shut that all down. Had nothing to do with the technology they had. It's just a real fear factor about it. Uh, I got to tour the South Texas nuclear project a few years back, and the interesting thing is they pull these spent fuel rods out of uh, the reactor, and the first thing they do is they drop them in a swimming pool that's sitting out there. It's just this big pool of water. It looks like a swimming pool. And, and then they leave them there for um, a while, and 90% of the, of the radioactivity dissipates into the atmosphere. And so, it, you know, it really is a technology that, that you shouldn't be afraid of if managed correctly. Uh, when Chernobyl happened and they melted down, they melted down through, I think, um, uh, six inches of concrete was their containment unit. South Texas Project has six inches of steel followed by four feet of uh, rebar reinforced concrete followed by another six inches of steel. We have tertiary redundant systems on everything in our nuclear facilities. Everything has three backups to it. And so it's a very safe technology, but there's still a fear factor, and that causes the cost to be too high in my view. And Southern may have it right. I don't know. So, anybody else? Yes, ma'am. You mentioned that a lot of the transmission operations are moving towards ISO and RTO. So what is ETT's relationship with ERCOT, and how is that different from the rest of the United States? And also, this is kind of maybe a basic question, but where does the revenue from transmission come from? Sure, sure. Two good questions. Um, so let me take the first one, and, and it's really pretty similar across the country in the RTO regions. In the non-RTO regions, basically the southeast um, and then most of the west except for California is a non-RTO region. And so you have vertically integrated utilities that operate and control the systems. In the RTO regions, which is pretty much everywhere else, um, New England, Mid-Atlantic, Midwest, Texas, and the Southwest um, uh, power pool, kind of the corridor up uh, from here, you have RTOs. And so the functional control of the grid, the decisions on dispatching generation is made at a, at a regional level, at a central level. So for example, I'll use ETT or AEP, who I work for AEP, I run ETT and AEP operators operate the ETT system. So what we do is we, um, we dispatch the system at a transmission level based on direction from ERCOT. So ERCOT will say, you need to close this line or you need to open this switch, and they'll move generation up and down. And so the work is still going on. We have a dispatch center that controls our grid, and there's these different dispatch centers that control their grids, but they're at the direction of this regional operator. And ERCOT up in Taylor has their uh, control center where they decide which generators move up and down. So our operators see our system but only ERCOT sees the whole ERCOT system. And we know when they tell us generation, we're going to increase the generation into your system, or we need you to you know, decrease the load coming out of your system, but we don't know what's going across the rest of ERCOT. And that applies for each of the RTOs. Each transmission owner manages its grid, but it's directed by ERCOT. And then the revenues, most of the revenues are, are through regulated rates. So again, Federal Energy Regulatory Commission in the non-Texas region, um, in ERCOT, 
the, the Texas Commission here sets rates. But what you basically do is there's a simple formula to calculate how much money you need to operate your system. It's called your revenue requirement. And so your revenue requirement is you take the total asset base times a return. So what's a reasonable return to allow you to recover your cost of capital? Both the cost of equity for issuing stock and the cost of debt for borrowing in some kind of a uh, percentage. So maybe 60% debt, 40% equity. And if your equity is 12% is what it costs you on the market and debt rates, um, you know, interest rates are 4%, you take the average and you come up with a 7.5% return on your assets is what is fair and reasonable. The commission decides that. They say your total asset base is $100 million. You multiply 7.5% times $100 million and you get, what is that, $7.5 million of return. And then what are your O&M costs? What are your depreciation expenses? What are your taxes? And then you add all that up and that says you need $80 million of revenue requirements per year to recover your costs and earn a reasonable return to attract capital into your business. So then the commission in Texas takes all the transmission costs of service, those revenue requirements, adds them up, and then allocates them out to the load. And load distribution companies pay on a monthly basis those amounts so that we can all collect our cost of service. If we see our, our cost rising such that that revenue requirement doesn't give us enough money, we go back to the commission and we file what's called a rate case and we lay out all of our costs and we say our costs are higher than our revenue. We have a higher revenue requirement. You need to raise the rates. If the commission sees that they believe we're making too much money, then they call us in for a rate case. They make us open our books and lay out our costs and they may reduce our rates to what they believe is a more appropriate revenue requirement. That's the stuff that makes newspapers is rate cases because we're all battling over what the right rates are. But it really comes down to just deciphering those costs and what is the right amount of money to maintain the company's financial integrity but to not allow it to earn uh, excess returns. So. Okay, thank you very much. Thank you, Dr. Ryan. Appreciate it. You bet. I enjoyed it. If you're in the portfolio program, don't forget we have a sign-in sheet in the back. Please give us your name, email, and EIN. Thanks a lot.